So today we are talking about prayer, if you did not gather that, uh, from the songs as well as from that little video. And uh, prayer is probably one of the most important aspects of your faith, if not the most important aspect of your faith. Interestingly enough, uh, despite what seems to be an ever-declining church attendance, not only in the U.S., but all across the world, a recent study found that 61% of Americans actually pray uh, and believe that prayer can be answered. In fact, only a small percentage of people, as you even saw in the video just now, only a small percentage of people really believe that there is no use for prayer at all. Interestingly, and, and I think this is important as well, interestingly enough, the people who pray the most are teenagers and Gen Z, so maybe we should worry less about them and they should worry more about us uh, <laughs> because they are more likely to pray than their parents' generation. The point in sharing that is that prayer, even for those unsure about following Jesus, even for those unsure about following Jesus, prayer is powerful. It is actually our most powerful gift. In fact, I heard this story that I want to share with you about a woman named Gladys Aldward. She felt compelled to go to China to share the good news of the gospel, believing that there was work for her to do there for Jesus. She had many struggles and many adventures in trying to follow and walk out this calling. And during one of those adventures, Gladys hiked to a remote area of China to look for a new village to possibly see if there was anyone there who had heard about Jesus. On the way, she met a Christian doctor. His name was Dr. Huang, and he agreed to join Gladys on this journey on the rest of her trip. At some point on the trip, they stopped on the side of the road, listen, and they prayed. They prayed a very specific prayer. They prayed that God would lead them to just one person who did not know Jesus. And immediately, immediately after they finished praying that prayer, there on a steep rocky path, they met a Buddhist priest called a Lama. They met a Buddhist priest there, and the Lama invited them to spend the night at the monastery where he lived with many other Lamas. And here's what the Lama said to their surprise, to Gladys and Dr. Huang's surprise. The Lama said, we have waited so long for you. Please come and tell us about the God who loves. You see, Eight years before, some of the lamas had found a Christian pamphlet sitting on the side of the road. And in that Christian pamphlet is one of the most famous verses in the Bible. Even, even when I didn't go to church, when I didn't believe that God was real, I knew this verse. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that any who would believe in him would not perish but rather have everlasting life. Let's add 17. Because I did not come to condemn the world, rather I came to rescue it. They had found a pamphlet with that verse in there. And they began to imagine who this God is that loves. They were amazed. They brought the pamphlet back to the monastery. They distributed it to all the other lamas. And they began to say to themselves and to each other that somewhere in the universe, there is a God who loves. But where could they find him? Well, one lama went on a very specific and long journey to seek the God who loved. He finally found a missionary who had given him a copy of the New Testament of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And together, those Buddhist lamas, they read the Gospels, but they didn't understand what they read. And here's one of the most amazing parts about this story. It says that they said to Gladys and to Dr. Huang, but we were not worried because the book that they gave us told us that Jesus told his disciples to go tell other people about the God who loved. So they had no concerns that eventually... Someone would show up to share with them the good news because Jesus told his followers to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So they thought to themselves, of course a Christian would come and of course they would tell them what they longed to know. Eight years later, after reading John 3.16, after the long journey to find the God who loved, after finding the New Testament and sharing it with the other lamas, they eagerly welcomed Christians into their home. And no doubt many of them also welcomed Jesus 
into their hearts. Now, there's a lot of parts of this story that I really wish I could sit down and camp on, but I don't have time. we got a lot to cover today. But the one thing that I, that I hope you wouldn't miss in a story like this is the power of prayer. That here you had a woman from the U.S. and China looking for an opportunity to share the gospel. She prays. She meets a Christian doctor, Dr. Huang. They pray. They meet a lama who had heard about the God who loved but didn't know who Jesus was. And at the same time, you've got this group of Buddhist priests reading the Bible, hoping that someone would come and tell them about the God who loved and believing in faith, by the way, that because the Bible said it, that it would happen and in a moment, two prayers meet to fundamentally transform a group of people. Prayer is our most powerful gift. It is our truest power. And my deep concern, and I stand at the front of the line, I'll say this several times during the message, prayer is a struggle for me. My deep concern is that we don't believe that prayer is our truest power. We believe that prayer is our backup plan. Prayer is for emergencies only. Prayer is when the oxygen masks drop. But we don't have a pray first culture. We don't. And my hope is that we would. Listen, whether you're in the room or whether you're there on renovation online, my hope is we would have a pray first culture. And so there's a couple of questions that I want to answer for you today. Because I don't want to assume anything. You know, I could say we need to pray in we could have three different ideas of who we're praying to. Okay? So there's a couple of questions I want to answer for us today. And the first one is this. What is Christian prayer? When you think about prayer, right, many other faiths and religions pray. So what is Christian prayer? What is the distinction of Christian prayer? prayer that is different than everything else. In fact, let me talk to the online church one more time. I want you to drop into the chat right now what your definition of Christian prayer is. And if y'all want to be weird here in the room, jump on YouTube right now. You can drop it in there too. Just have some fun. Be like, you're missing out. The room is awesome. Okay? (laughs) What is Christian prayer? Well, first of all, prayer is the most important activity of a Christian life. And prayer is the very purpose for which you were made. Did you know that? Prayer is the very purpose for which you were made. Why? Because when we pray, we are reversing what was broken in Genesis. You see, Genesis tells us that Adam and Eve got to walk with God in the cool of the day, which means that they were in constant communication with him. And then that was severed by their pride and by their sin. And so when we pray, we are remending what was broken. Prayer. It's first and foremost communication with God and cultivation of a love relationship with him. Prayer first and foremost is communication with Father God and a cultivation of a love relationship with him. And just by that simple definition alone, Christian prayer is distinguished from any other form of prayer. In fact, the Apostle Paul wrote in Ephesians 2.18, I'm going to paraphrase it. Uh, He said this, through Jesus, we both, that's Jews and Gentiles, and the whole known world, have access to the Father by one spirit. So let me say it one more time. Christian prayer is relational communication with Yahweh, our Father. Prayer is first and foremost about relationships. It's about relationship with a father. A couple of weeks ago, we talked about the prodigal son, the story of the prodigal son and this image of God as the father standing on the roadside, looking over the hill, looking down the road. Is he coming back today? Is he coming back today? Is he going to return today? That is the image that God has shown us in his scriptures. And so what prayer is, is our engaging God as a father who wants wants to talk to us, who wants to relate to us. He wants to relate to us. Listen, quick story, November 9th, 2009, my fireball came into the world. Her name is Eva Grace. And the mix of fear and excitement, we already had one child, but this was a child that Brianna used to have to wake up to nurse. So this is a very easy child. And then we got a child that didn't sleep at all. 
Okay, I'm pretty sure she was taking no dose and drinking coffee every night, right? And, and, and so this little fireball comes into the world. And before Brianna and I had children, guess what? We had lots of ideas about children. So if you ain't got no kids, mind your business. Because you don't know what it's like. It's like reading about prison and going to prison. Those are two different experiences. Okay? So if you ain't got them yet, you just stand back and watch. Right? And pray that you learn something before they come. We had a lot of ideas about kids. A lot of ideas. And we knew the basics, right? We're going to have to feed them. Might have to beat them. But at no point did it cross our minds, at least it didn't cross my mind, I'm going to have to relate to these people. Like, relationally. Like, this is a whole human being with thoughts and feelings and emotions and insanity. And I'm going to have to relate to this person. But I can tell you one thing above all, and I do believe this about anybody who wants kids, who isn't, you know, completely off the rocker. Over these last 16 years, 16 years, we've been raising kids. I know, wow is the right there. Like, I just want to lay down on the stage. You realize it's 10 years between my oldest and my youngest? I'm going to be parenting forever. Okay, forever. Over these 16 years, we've learned a lot of things. We've learned a lot of things. We learned a lot of lessons, mostly from mistakes that we made. Lots of mistakes. Poor Eden, our test subject. Listen, give your oldest child special honor because that's the one that you made all the mistakes on. Okay? Right? And the youngest child, like they're basically parenting themselves. So it's, you know, that like we honest, let's be real. Once you get past two, it's zone defense. And even then, sometimes the corners just lay back. Right? 16 years. 16 years. And here's what I know that I know that I know. Out of all the mistakes, all of the stumbles, all of the troubles, all of the challenges, all of the ways we could have done it better, here's what I know for a fact. That me and this woman want our children to flourish. We want them to walk in their calling. We want them to discover their destiny. We want them to find love and joy and peace and happiness. We want them to be fulfilled. We want them to make a difference in the world. We want them to impact their situation rather than being impacted by their situation. These are the things that we want for our children. And here's what I'm saying to you. If I, a sinful messed up man, want that for my kids, how much more? Does a perfect, loving father want for his children? How much more? How much more? He has no sin. There is no shadow of turning with him. If I want my kids to flourish, how much more does the father want us to flourish? That's who he is. And that's why he wants to talk to us. That is God's love for us. He desires communion with us. He desires to relate to us. Beautifully, not only can we talk to the Father, but we can, we can pray to Jesus, our big brother, our Savior. The one who said no greater love, listen, this is one of my favorite verses, no greater love does a man have for his friends than this to lay down his life for them. Can I ask you a question? Do you feel like you're Jesus' friend? Or do you feel like he's just waiting for the next thing so he can be done with you? That's not who Jesus is. One of the greatest gifts you've ever been given, if you're follow the way of Jesus, is Jesus calls you friend. And the friendship is not based on your fidelity, on his. He calls you friend. And you can pray to your friend Jesus. Listen, you can pray to the Holy Spirit. 
you can pray to the Holy Spirit. That's why Alpha Weekend is so important. Because we're going to spend the entire weekend talking about the Holy Spirit. You remember a couple of weeks ago, we were looking at that verse in Revelation. That was this last week, I think. We're looking at that verse in Revelation. Revelation. Shun. You got it? Revelation. No S. Just shun. Right? Chapter 3. Where Jesus says he knocks at the door. He wants to come in. How does he come in? He comes in by his spirit. And so we can pray to the Holy Spirit. Listen, Paul says that God helps us pray by the Spirit. In Romans chapter 8, he says, when you don't have words, the Spirit will pray them for you. Because he's got a direct line to the heart of the Father. The point in all of this is that at the end of the day, whether we're talking to the Father who loves us, or the Son who died for us, or the Spirit who empowers us, God wants to relate to you. That is the point of prayer. That is the primary point of of prayer. It is the thing for which you were made, which is to walk with God and talk with God. Now that we know what Christian prayer is, the question may be then why should we pray? Why should we pray? Well, this is very simple, and I don't mean that in any condescending way. If you didn't talk to the people you say you loved, but once every two to three weeks, how would your relationship be doing? Right? I'm not talking about leveraging the silent treatment to win a marriage argument. <laughs> I was pulling a pin and throwing a grenade. Okay, I just, in case you missed it. All right, look. I'm talking about the fact that no relationship can thrive where there's not communication. You know, communication breakdown is the end of marriages and friendships, yeah. engagement, and dating relationships. Mm -hmm. It's when the communication breaks down. If you can actually talk to each other, you can get through just about anything. Yeah. But when the communication starts to break down, guess what? The relationship starts to devolve. And it's the same with our relationship with God. If we're not talking to him, <laughs> if we're not talking to him, then our relationship with him is not growing. Do you know that, mo I'm not going to say you, I'm going to say me. Can I say me? Yeah. Most of the time when I'm suspicious of God, it's because I've not been talking to him, not because he hasn't been talking to me. When I get suspicious of what he's doing, what he wants, why this is happening, it's generally because I haven't opened up a dialogue in weeks. And so then when something doesn't go the way that I want it to go, I'm like, well, God, where were you? And he's like sitting right here waiting to talk about it. <laughs> Did you pray first? No. <laughs> what you mad at me for? That's how God talks to me. I don't know how he talks to you. That's how I talk to him. What are you saying to me for? This ain't about me. I've been sitting right here, same place, same station, tuned in, waiting to hear from you. But no, you want to do things your way. And then when they go awry, you want to blame me. God says, no, I want to talk to you. I want to talk to you. That's why we pray so that we grow our relationship so that we are aligned. So that, so that we are on the same page. You can't be on the same page with somebody you don't talk to. That's some free marriage advice too. If you're not talking, you're not on the same page. It's the same with our relationship with God. Not only that, but when we pray... One of the reasons we pray, why we pray, is because there are rewards associated with prayer. Listen to this, Matthew 6, 6, when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your father who is unseen. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. He will reward you. Now, the context for this, you may know, 
when they were asking Jesus how to pray, and he was like, don't pray like these people, the Gentiles who call on a Rolodex of different gods to try and pull the right string to get the right answer. And don't pray like these Pharisees over here who pray out in public so that everybody could see and be like, oh, they're so holy. No, you pray in a way that is pure and undefiled. And when you do it, God's going to see it, and he will, will reward you. That's why we pray, so that we can get the rewards of prayer. What are the rewards of prayer? First of all, it's the presence of God. The first reward of prayer is the presence of God. Remember the first week when we talked about is there more to life than this? And one of the things that we said is that we all have this deep spiritual hunger that we try to satisfy with junk food, but we never get full. Why? Because only the presence of God can satisfy the soul. Only the presence of God can satisfy the soul. Only the presence of God can quench our spiritual thirst. It refreshes the soul. Listen, prayer is like the soul breathing, inhaling, and finding life. So we get the presence of God. Second reward of prayer is we get the peace of God. I don't know about you, but I can use a little bit of peace. Got a little bit of worry. Sprinkle some general anxiety on top of that, it can turn into a rough day. I need the peace of God. I need the peace of God. In fact, someone said this. They said that worry is like a rocking chair. It gives you something to do, but it doesn't get you anywhere. Corey Tim Boom. Corey Tim Boom said this. And this is a woman who survived the Holocaust, by the way. Worry doesn't empty tomorrow of its troubles, but it empties today of its strength. Worrying about it is not going to solve it. And so the Apostle Paul, here we go, peace of God in prayer. The Apostle Paul responds to our worries in Philippians 4 saying what? Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything. Those two words, those are, the, those are the features. It's forming this beautiful chiasm, anything versus everything. Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving. Let your requests be known to God Woo! and the peace of God. Every time I read it, I get excited. And the peace of God. That transcends all understanding will keep your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. Let me just break down this illustration for you real quick. When Paul writes, the peace of God will guard your heart and mind. What I need you to imagine, wherever you are right now, close your eyes. What I need you to imagine, the words that he has chosen, is that it is like a military garrison standing shoulder to shoulder, shields up, weapons out, surrounding something so precious that it would die to make sure that it was not touched. And what Paul is saying is that when we take those things to God, he dispenses his peace and it surrounds us in such a way that it protects precious cargo and will lay everything down to make sure we're secure. You want your heart and your mind secure? Seek the peace of God in prayer. Seek the peace of God in prayer with thanksgiving. You know, gratitude will go a long way. And it transforms our hearts. Not only do, do we get the peace of God as a reward, but we get perspective. Prayer gives us perspective. Sometimes we're looking at a situation all wrong. I've found that when I pray, problems that I thought were massive become itty bitty. Because all of a sudden, the Holy Ghost gives me solutions that I can't find in 20 books. Prayer gives us perspective. It's the gift of perspective, the reward of perspective. And then the final reward of prayer, why should we pray? It's because we get power. We get power. It is the power of prayer. Prayer not only changes us, it changes situations. It changes situations. It changes circumstances. Amazing things happen when we pray. 
Archbishop of Canterbury, William Temple, said this, when I pray, coincidences happen. When I don't, they don't. Richard Foster, I've quoted this many, many times before, but I love it so much. Richard Foster says, we are working with God to determine the future. Certain things will happen in history if we pray rightly. We are to change the world by prayer. Do you actually believe that? Can I testify? We have women in this church. Doctors told them they would never have a child, and so we prayed. And now they have multiple children. Multiple children. We've seen people healed from all sorts of diseases. My own son was raised from death back to life. We believe in the power of prayer. Prayer changes things. And that's why we pray. But I think one of the reasons we don't pray is because we, we fear it won't go our way. Or that God won't answer. And so it's a fair question. Does God always answer prayer? The answer is no. Not always. Not the way that you want him to. He always hears. But he doesn't always give you the answer that you want. Why? Because he's a good father. And anybody with children knows that sometimes... Sometimes our children's desires don't align with their flourishing. Sometimes our children's requests don't align with their good. And so because we are the parent that can see further down the road of their lives, we can step back and say, I know that you want this, but I can't let you have it. God, who sits outside of time, who sits at the intersection of past, present, and future, all laid out like a spreadsheet before him, who sits outside of time, he sees it all from beginning to end, and you want this thing so bad, and you think it's going to change your life, and you think it's what you need, and God is saying, no, because if I give you that, it's going to trigger this, and you're going to end up here completely out of position for the assignment that I've given you. You end up not flourishing. You'll end up floundering instead of flourishing. And a good father is not going to just let you flounder without fighting it. Anybody with children knows that. I don't know what it is about two-year-olds and running towards streets. But it's like it's where they want to be. I, I don't get it. Every one of my children, right around two, two and a half, street, gone. Uh, it's incredible, right? I've saved more lives than Superman at the edge of streets. That's right. Why? They want to be out there, but I don't want to see them hit by a car. Where they want to go is not best for them. That relationship is not best for you. That person is not best for you. Listen, that job is not best for you. I know it means more money, but it also means the death of your soul. So God is not answering that prayer because he wants to see you flourish. He wants to see you flourish. He's a good father who loves you. I can think of more than a few occasions in my life when I really, really, really desperately wanted something. And I prayed for it over and over and over again. One was to make a relationship work that needed to end. (laughs) You knew it was supposed to be over. But you hanging on for dear life for all kinds of messed up and sinful reasons. Praying to figure out how to make it work. And the Lord is just disrupting that thing with passionate fury. Every turn, they get harder and harder. They get crazier and crazier. 
you excuse the key of the car, you come out your tire slash. Oh, what do I got to do? Okay, we're going to make this work. Lord, we're going to make it work. And he's like, no, you're not. No, you're not. Because that's not flourishing for you. Another was where I wanted to live in a particular city, and I fought hard to get there. I tried to get traded there when I was still playing ball. I almost accepted a weird military marriage invitation to get extra housing allowance. <laughs> oh, yeah. Another story for another time. I said no. I had never been proposed to. I was taken aback. <laughs> yeah, I got proposed to. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Nothing I can do about that. Another time I thought about taking a church there. To escape the one God gave me. And I'm so glad that God said no. I'm so glad because if he had said yes, I wouldn't have the wife and the family that I have. That has been such a gift to me. And I wouldn't have the spiritual family that I have that I love so very much. My life in total would be different. So I'm glad God said no to something. Sometimes he says, wait, which can be just as hard. But you do understand that a lot of times when God says wait, it's because he's cultivating you to be the person that you need to be to stand in the thing that you're asking for. Because if he lets you get there now, you're going to mess it up. So no, God doesn't always answer the way we want him to, but he always answers right. Last two questions. How do we pray? Is there a special way to pray? No. Very simple. No. It's a conversation. You shape it the way that God leads you to shape it. You can use the Lord's Prayer. We use that here sometimes. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. And then we just camp out on the, the image of God as a father and, and we just go through the whole Lord's Prayer that way. You can use the Acts paradigm, right? Adoration, confession. I find that confession is very healing for the soul. Confession, then thanksgiving. Thank you, Lord, for what you've already done. And then supplication. Here are the things that I need. But notice that it doesn't start with what you need. It starts with who he is. Right? So, no, there's not a certain way to pray. You just pray. You don't have to have special words. One of my favorite prayers in the Bible, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. What an honest prayer. What a beautiful prayer. There's not a special way you pray. You just pray. Start praying today, which is the last question. When should you pray? Every day. If you're a follower of Jesus, every day. Every day. You have an opportunity to commune with the Father every single day. And if you're not yet to follow the way of Jesus, listen. I bet if you begin praying, God will become more real to you than he has ever been before. Because here's my testimony. I have found in over 20 years of following Jesus that prayer works, that prayer changes. Prayer changes me. Prayer changes situations. Prayer changes circumstances. Whenever I start to have a lapse in faith, honestly, when I start to believe the wrong things about God or not believe God, the first question I ask myself is, when's the last time y'all talked? And very often I find that it has been some time. When I'm filled with fear or anxiety or anguish, I think, when's the last time you talked to dad? And I always find it's been some time. And so my invitation to you today is to believe that prayer is your truest power. It works. It works. And if we become pray first people, everything else in our lives will be ordered. Let's pray. Father, we thank you now in the name of Jesus that your word has guided us, instructed us, empowered us, strengthened us, opened up our eyes and our hearts and our minds. And we pray, Lord, that you would give us an appetite for prayer, a desire for prayer, a passion for prayer. 
that you would open up our desire to commune with you so that we can be a prayer-shaped people. We ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen and amen. Can we stand to worship?